got the ACC Big Ten Challenge. You've got competition between the Big 12 and the Pac-10, but those are between the entire conferences. What's the deal with the SEC and the Big East? Hey, how are you folks? Jason Horowitz. Glad to be with you on CBSSports.com. It's time for Parrish's Three Pointers, which of course means we talk to our CBSSports.com college basketball columnist, Gary Parrish. And uh, GP, it's called the SEC Big East Shootout, but you have four games, two on Tuesday, two on Thursday. Why call it anything? Yeah, it's the worst of the conference matchups, uh, you know, things, because it offers no really great matchups. The main reason is because of ESPN. If ESPN isn't involved to televise eight games, then there won't be eight games. It's all about TV. So if ESPN decides that wants to do the eight games next season and produce eight, you know, uh, you know uh, eight great matchups, then we'll get those eight games and those great matchups. You'd be surprised how much ESPN controls scheduling in college basketball because almost no coach will turn down the exposure, but if the TV's not there, Nobody's interested in playing the games, and this is another example. Well, one of the games in there is Marquette, Tennessee. That is a good matchup. We'll have a preview of that with you, of course, here on the site, CBSSports.com. Let's talk about a big win over the weekend. Arizona knocking off Gonzaga. It was the first uh, loss this year for the Zags. But uh, let's talk about the Wildcats here, Gary, because in the offseason, of course, all the talk about Lute Olsen, him retiring from Arizona, and, and all the players that transferred away from Tucson. Is it possible that overshadowed a team that could still be a good basketball team? There's no question. It, it took a lot of focus away from the roster. And the roster always was going to have Chase Buttinger and Jordan Hill. And how many teams have two NBA players on their roster? Not a whole bunch. So the talent is there not to be great, but to be pretty good. But the reason the expectations were low was because, just like you said, the Lute Olsen circus, and it was hard to figure out how that wouldn't affect this team. And then on the other hand, you know, could Russ Pennell, was he up to do this to this challenge? The guy had never been a head coach at this level. So far, so good, though. I mean, uh, and because the Pac-10 is down, it's reasonable to think Arizona can be back in the NCAA tournament, and that'd be a, an achievement in itself. And they're 7-2, and two, and both of their losses by a point each. Uh, so they have been playing good basketball. All right, a couple of other upsets this weekend. Kansas lost uh, to UMass on a neutral floor, sort of, but not really. It was a home game for the Jayhawks. And then Temple beat Tennessee. In the long run, which one of those two games will have a longer lasting effect? The KU lost to UMass because UMass is uh, horrible, and that's going to be a bad loss on Selection Sunday, no question. Plus, here's the problem. The Jayhawks still have non-league games with Temple, Arizona, Tennessee, and Michigan State. That's before Big 12 play starts. So they could take five or six losses in the league play because Bill Self, by his own admission, overscheduled given the losses he endured. So from my standpoint, this is setting up to be a season like the season Florida had last season. I won't be surprised if Kansas takes four or five losses into the Big 12. Then you take another five or six in league play, take another one in the league tournament, you're sitting there with 11, 12 losses on Selection Sunday. And if that's the case, you're on the bubble. And if you're on the bubble, you don't want to have bad losses on your resume, which brings us back to the UMass loss, that UMass loss is going to be bad. Now a couple of key wins over some of those teams you mentioned would be nice, but they got to get them and they got to start playing better. Uh, one of the losses that Kansas has this season is to Syracuse, and that's another hot topic in college basketball right now, Gary. Eric Devendorf, uh, suspended by the university but still playing for Jim Beheim, Is that a problem for you? It's a problem in as much that I don't understand it. Uh, my, my view is this. He was clearly in some kind of altercation with a woman. That's not disputable. His teammate was sending text messages to the woman apologizing and, and, and basically asking for forgiveness. My thing has always been if my teammate was being uh, falsely accused of something by a woman, I would not be asking her uh, for forgiveness. I would be saying, why are you ruining my teammate's life over something you know didn't happen? So that doesn't uh, bode well for, for Devendorf, I don't think. And then, beyond all that, he's been found guilty and suspended by the judicial board at Syracuse. Those are all facts. And to me, that, says, that suggests he should be sitting. Look, if the appeal is granted, good for him. Reinstate him then, and then, and then three, you know, the three or four games he misses in the meantime can be a pseudo-suspension just for being stupid and putting himself in a bad situation. If the appeal isn't granted, then Syracuse is going to be without him in March anyway, and it might as well get used to playing without him now. So to me, that makes the most sense. And honestly, I'm a little surprised it hasn't gone that route. Well, they played without him. They did play without him last year as he was injured. We'll see what happens in the few, in the next coming weeks uh, when they decide on the appeal. Gary Parrish, thank you very much, sir. We'll talk to you throughout the week. All right, buddy. Take care. All right, folks. For more on college basketball, be sure to read everything that Gary's writing here on CBSSports.com. For GP, I'm Jason Horowitz. Take care, folks.